everyone, and welcome to our Men's Health Week panel for 2023. My name's Rob Anderson. I'm CEO of Autism Awareness Australia, and today it's my privilege to be hosting uh, today's panel. From the outset, I want to acknowledge the country uh, from which we meet today. I'm on Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung country, uh, the Kulin Nation, and just want to recognise elders past, present and emerging and recognise all the lands on which we meet, on lands which have never been uh, ceded. So joining me today are three fantastic men within the autism community, Rob Vasili and Charles. We're going to be having a chat about men's health in the autism community, uh, our tips for looking after yourself and how we can introduce uh, and increase awareness and support. Uh, so thanks for joining me today, everyone. Uh, so first off, let's introduce ourselves and our connections to the autism community. If I could start with you, Robert. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So I'm, uh, I'm in the autistic community with my son, Leo. He's uh, almost seven years old. He's ASD3, nonverbal with an intellectual disability. So I've uh, been part of this community, I suppose, now for the last five years and learning a lot about myself, the family, mental health along the way. So, um, yeah, excited to be here. Fantastic. Vasily. Sure thing. Um, my name is Vasily. I'm a father of a beautiful autistic boy who is five years old now. So, um, next year, hopefully he's going to go to school. Um, I'm also um, a director of the Early Intervention Clinic here in Sydney and um, studying my post-graduate um, um, studies in autism at university. So, Busy man, a uh, lot of things on, and uh, but most most importantly, um, really learning a lot from my son who's autistic. So enjoying every single day with it. Fantastic, Vasily. Welcome, and Charles to round it out. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Charles. I'm I'm, I'm I am autistic. Um, as an adult, I'm a late diagnosed adult, so I've been in the community for three years now, um, and I predominantly try and um, now you. I, you know, when I first started telling people I was autistic, uh, it seems like in my community and um, sphere of people I know, no one's even come across it before. So my barrier is really um, to try and um, explain it um, for myself. But then I realized that actually, if I, if I can solve that, then maybe I can solve it for other people as well. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I do. Fantastic. That's great. All right. Uh, first question, and this is a question for everybody, just jump in where you like. Um, health and being healthy looks different for every single one of us. Uh, let's go around and share what health looks like for us as individuals. Charles, I might start with you. Okay. I wrote notes. I'm cheating. But um, right. Okay. So what did I put for this? Okay. Health. Um well, for me, uh, actually, it's about um, being aware of my body um, because often I'm not. And so, um, for example, if I get sick, I don't realize until I'm really sick or um, I don't feel cold or hunger. So um, it's about um, paying attention and learning to pay attention. Um, that was That's my key thing. Fantastic. Um, so what does health look like for you, Vasily? I don't understand the question, Robert, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so I guess everybody's got their own sense of what health is and being healthy. Um, for you, um, to describe a healthy you, what does okay, it sure. um, oh, th Thanks for a great question, Rob. Um, look, for me, the journey to be healthy has probably been um, up and down, especially since I, my son got diagnosed with autism. I've probably taken on a journey of the downhill um, you know, find myself, you know, sometimes, you know, taking extra drinks after work, um, you know, trying to work longer hours. And it just overall was very stressed and uh, um, started gaining weight, um, not looking after myself. And, you know, keep in mind, I come from a CrossFit background. So like I've been, you know, competing and exercising for a while. But um, since the diagnosis kind of like, you know, everything went on the back burner. So from, you know, healthy 75 kilo man, I've turned into 110 kilo man. <laughs> Um, you know, now five years in, you know, I'm more under control of my weight, obviously looking after myself. I haven't been drinking and completely sober for 15 months now. And, um, so this is probably like what I've learned a lot. So, um, from through entire, through this journey that, um, number one, look after yourself. It's easy to get, um, to lose the track. Everything that you earned before 
can disappear very, very easily. And it's important just to keep, keep up with yourself and be realistic and be honest. And if you are feeling overwhelmed and uh, feeling, you know, that things are just, you know, too much, ask for help and seek for help. Some great messages there. I know I can relate to uh, a lot of what you've mentioned there uh, myself. So, so Rob, for you? Yeah, I think it's um it's a good point Vasily makes and I, I kind of echo it in many respects. I'm sure there's some similarities for many dads listing, but I mean, health for a lot of people, it looks like physical health and that's exercise and that's important to me too. My background is fitness industry, so I'm kind of similar like that, but also... Um, you know the mental health side of things, which we, I'm sure we'll talk more about today. Like it's um, it is important to to when it comes to what does health look like. People, many dads, maybe not really have been exposed to some of the challenges that um, you know, being a dad to someone who's autistic might actually present themselves from a mental health point of view. So I think part of being healthy, I've learned, is <laughs> as is a mindset. It, it's actually also about ask as, as Vasily said, asking for help, but but talking about it like we're doing now, you know, like that that's also health because it, 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 the worst thing you can do is 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 not talk about it or bottle it up or pretend it's going to be okay. And, and sometimes you, you, it's not and you need help and you need to ask and the, you need that avenue. So I think healthy is actually being vulnerable and talking about it as much as the, what people might think, such as what I eat, whether I exercise. It's, it's about how we talk talk about ourselves and talk to others. That's amazing, Rob. I think acknowledging it's um it's a key thing here, and um, I admire all three of us, you know, for the fact that we, you know, everyone coming from a different backgrounds and you know different walks of lives, and uh, you know, Charles, um, as mentioned, you know, um, been um diagnosed um three years ago, and you know, being open about this, it's really important, and you know, myself about my past demons, you know, to talk about that, it's really important too. So, you know, I, thank you guys for joining us today. Yeah, and, and, and I wanted to add to Rob too, which is one of the first lessons I learned was how I talk about myself because I was always very negative and I'd always, in a paper, did anything good. I would always be like, by some, like by some fluke, I managed to get a job. And, you know, and I was fortunate that someone actually um, stopped me and held me up on that. And they went, hey, I've just noticed that you, 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 you know, you're talking in this way. Have you thought about doing it this way? And it was life changing in terms of, because yeah because you listen to how you talk about yourself and so if you focus on not doing that stuff actually some of that self-esteem problems and stuff kind of go away and then you do have a better body image which you know actually opens the gateway to more health anyway yeah i think um traditionally men we haven't been very uh good at um uh, talking to each other talking genuinely about each other showing vulnerability um, and also just the notion of not wanting to be a burden. I know certainly I haven't uh, shared a lot of uh, the dramas of home life with uh, family and friends um, uh, when I know I, I needed to and need to continue to do that. It's not natural for, for me to do that, and I, I know it's a limitation. I think as a society where we are really improving a whole lot in in that regard and and people are being respected uh for showing their vulnerability and i think that's critical uh to uh an authentic self um and critical to being able to be best not just for yourself but being best for other people too um rob you've been working in the uh, fitness industry for you know for 20 years plus and you've had a specific focus um in this area as well could you just share us share with us some of your experience in that regard in terms of in terms of what specifically rob what are you, well, are you if it's more? physical health the for yeah. autistic people parents and carers yeah i think that um you know i've uh, I, I work for a company called weflex and we kind of help people with disabilities get active and get matched with trainers and and get access to health and fitness that that you and i can get um the, the reason we exist and the reason it's an it's an issue is um there's so many preventable uh i suppose health problems that people with disabilities and people that are autistic actually find themselves in based on dietary requirements sedentary lifestyle you know number of places they can go accessibility to sport accessibility to many things that lead to an active lifestyle and it just puts there's a lot of barriers that have existed and continue to exist that we, we're working hard to remove but um, I, I think it's um, it's very normal uh, 
uh, for the autistic community, as in people that have autism and also their families, it's very normal for activity to be something that is uh, increasingly difficult, both for for, for the kids uh, and adults involved and also for the, the caregivers because of, as I said, some of those barriers. So, I mean, our whole business is set up to try and remove them uh, and, and accredit trainers across the country to make sure that there is people that can help them and that, that there is an option other than OT and speech that, you know, why not have fitness and why not have someone that can help you get moving because mainstream sport isn't an option. Um, we resonate a lot with younger families because of that reason and uh, uh, and that's great. But also every time I speak to um, uh, one of our clients, it's it's I'm speaking to their, their parents and their dads and their kids, you know, and I can see that they're not looking after themselves and they're not taking it themselves as well. So, um, I think just in general, exercise and activity and health and all the benefits that come from it is harder. Uh, Vasily mentioned, you know, um, the dip. I think we've all been been through that and it depends on where you started from. So I think, um, yeah, but it's I, I've learned a couple of things. I've learned that there is options out there um, for, for people. You know, we just have to, you have to look a bit harder. There's a lot of places like us that are trying to do stuff in the space, but you have to look a little bit harder. Um but also that from from ourselves as dads, um, we've got to be kind to ourselves and it might look a bit different what, what it looks like now, but we've also got to be kind to ourselves and maybe a bit creative in how we how we find time. Um, because as I've learned, and I always he preach it, but uh, if I'm running on empty, I'm no good to myself, I'm no good to my family, I'm no good to 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 my work anywhere. So if I'm not looking after myself, but I'm not active, but I'm not doing things that help me have a good relationship with exercise and health, then uh, I'm more likely to react uh, poorly to a, to a challenging situation from my son. I'm more likely to not cope well uh, and not deal with stresses as well, which then bleeds into to the family life. And that's, um, you know, we've all had our challenges and I, I just know I'm a, I'm a better person when I'm actually um, more active and taking some time for myself. Not much, just a little bit. Um, so, but but it's 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 hard, so... Mm. So, so just picking up on that, this, like, you're, you're, you know, you're a dad to a, a little, little boy on the, on the spectrum. And just about, you mentioned it a little bit, um, earlier on, but just have, how have you found time to, to be able to do that? And what sort of things do you do? Look, finding time is, is, um, is challenging, especially like we as dads, you know, we have to work, um, we've got our full time jobs, uh, you know, also at the same time. I've uh, got kids. Um, sometimes, you know, you got to jump in and, you know, do the school pickups, take your son to therapy and so on. Um, so it's challenging. Um, I've personally for myself right now found that, um, you know, consistency is the key. So I've allocated myself three hours per week to do my exercises. So I go to the gym. Um, obviously I'm not no longer, I'm no longer 20. So I can't go to the gym and kill myself there in terms of some ferocious exercise. So it's pretty simple just to maintain, but it's all about the, um, the consistency. And, um, I think, um, you know, finding time is important, but at the same time, it's also important to have the balance. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we in the families, like, you know, we've got our wives. So we can't just go like, Oh, I want to go to the gym and see you later. <laughs> Yeah. And you're probably better not to come back home than after that. So um <laughs> you gotta you gotta you gotta find the balance in the in the family. So it's um it's really I think it's uh finding time the the key component for that is to within the family to discuss and be open with your partner. Uh for example, I with myself, you know, I had to be open with, um honest, I had to be honest to myself and say, look, Vasily, you are overweight and you know, things need to be changed. But at the same time, I had to be open to my wife as well and say, look, I am in a dark place right now, so I need some help. And, um, you know, I do need to go to the gym and, you know, I need an extra, extra three, four hours per week. So, you know, do you mind looking after the kids? Do you mind to, you know, take on some of those responsibilities that I do? And, you know, having a supportive wife, I think it's a key, um, you know, to, to this whole, um, to the question, finding the time. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Can I can I just add to that, Rob? One thing that Vincili said that I think is really important that I've learned, and I want to tell every dad whenever I get the chance, you've got to ask for what you need. Um, you can't assume. You can very easily get into our what we talk to ourselves, as Charles was saying about, oh, um, it's too busy. I don't have time. I can't do this. So you know, you tell yourself all the reasons and excuses why your wife's not going to say no. Whoever's not going to say is supportive. You got to learn to ask for what you need, as Vasily just articulated. Like, I need this. This is what's important to me. Um, and also the same. It's not just about you, right? So then, what can I do for you 
to make sure as you know for, for my wife for example what can i do to support you because this is what i need so surely you need something too and chances are they're like oh yeah absolutely i do but i just didn't want to ask because i didn't want to i thought it would be too much anyway it seems so simple but geez oh, no. um, i i think i think it's important and um this morning i was reading a book about autism advocacy actually um and one of the points she made was by advocating for yourself either as an autist or an autistic carer um you're each you're also teaching them to advocate for themselves so like um like we don't really know like how to ask for help um but if we but we learn by copying and so like if i see you openly saying and communicating with your partner and saying i need this then like that enables me to do that otherwise i don't know that thing exists so Charles, I just uh, wondering, do, you, do you think it's it's more difficult for uh, people on the autism spectrum to be physically healthy? Do you think it's more challenging? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah yes. Um, like because there's things like sensory things, like um, and even season changes. Like um, I had to stop running because I just um, I couldn't deal with how cold it is. Um, but um, again, like for me, I have to follow my schedule. So, um, yeah, you know, like there's a whole lot of like other factors that come into whether we can do something. Like across the road from me, there's this pretty cool gym. Um, but also like people are kind of scary and it's always full of people. And, and I like techno, but not their type of techno. And so, uh, you know, I just I've never asked. I look at it and go, wow, that looks really cool. Um, but um, one thing I was going to say that, um, helped me and, and maybe helps is is like the concept of habit stacking as well. So like I um, I started with the rule that every time I got out of bed I had to do ten push ups, um, and then I got to twenty five, and now I do like push ups, some squatty things, and some pull ups, and um, it takes the same amount of time. But it's just because like um, for me I'm like oh I can't leave bed until I do that, um, and it. And it really works and because yes the benefits of exercise are so amazing that like you know you need to do it really yeah, absolutely i mean you, you touch on that consistency like doing that each day and Vasily said that too it's not a matter of just going crazy it's about the consistent approach to to maintain that we've talked about physical health a lot and we've touched on the relationship with um mental health um but just going around i'd, I'd just like to get your thoughts on you know your thoughts on on mental health, particularly with our, our community, your your experience, and uh, and what we need to do to take care of uh, the mental um, mental health of us all, um, Rob. Yeah, I I wouldn't mind sharing my story if it's okay, Rob. I think um, mm. I um, was in a mental health hospital about two years ago. Um, and I, I'm so glad I, I I went there to get some professional help. Um, I, I'm a kind of guy that I think many dads can relate to. Um, I have two, you know, I have the pre-autism world, and then I have the post-autism world since my son's diagnosis. And um, before his diagnosis, I, I was a uh, you know very positive, very optimistic, very you know, largely successful, in control kind of a guy and um, thought I could apply the same things that have worked for me in my life um, to being a dad and, and being a dad of autism and just take it all in my stride and she'll be right. And, and I didn't realise that much like a you know frog in boiling water, I can't think of a better analogy, I, I, I was slowly just losing control, losing grip, becoming overwhelmed, becoming not just stressed, but it just started to have a real inability to cope Um and my reactions and my behaviors, and they just started slowly, slowly becoming more out of control. And that's really what it felt like. It felt like I was just, you know, waves were just coming in and I was just, I, I just couldn't, couldn't keep my head above water. Uh, and it was coming out in, you know, emotional outbursts, verbal outbursts, just, just, I just couldn't control myself to the point that around my son, whenever he was having a behavior of concern, I would just end up escalating it because of my reactions. And, um, meltdowns would be magnified because I, I would just be like pouring fire onto it in terms of my response. I just wasn't coping and all those things, which maybe many dads can relate to, but it, it, I thought it'll be okay. I'll be fine. I just need to 
you know, uh, tomorrow's a new day. I just need to get through it. And I wasn't able to fully see how far gone I, I was. And it took my wife incredible courage to tell me that I need to get professional help. And when I rebutted and was very proud and said, nah, oh, I'm like, it's okay. Oh, I've got it. It's under control. She's like, you clearly don't. I think you need to go outside of the house to get some help. And I said, well, what do you mean? It's going to be so much harder without me here. Like you're going to have to do everything on your own. And it wasn't until she said it would actually be more manageable on our own than without you here. And I just had and that completely floored me. And I thought, my God, like how this is bad. Um, and I kind of, and she said, look, you need to do this because if you don't, I'm not sure how we keep going as, as, as the family. Like it's going to be, I can't deal with it anymore. Um, our older son can't deal with it anymore. Um, and I thought, well, oh my God. So I ended up going to mental health hospital. Um, it was a great decision. I felt very supported by everyone there. I was diagnosed with adjustment disorder with depressed mood, um, combination of medication and, 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 um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and seeing a team I was there for a couple of weeks, two years on now, I'm, you know, still on some medication to manage my mental health, but I'm still trying to apply all the techniques and things I learned. I still have very bad days. I have more good days. Um, I've learned to be kind to myself. I've learned many things, but um, I, I don't mind sharing that story because I think it's very uh, similar to what a, uh, the pride that guys can have, the ego that we can have, the it's going to be okay, I'll be fine. And I... I I stand here, like I, I talk to you guys now knowing that if I hadn't have made that decision and had that push and encouragement, I, I'd probably be apart from my kids and my family now. I'd probably be in, in, a, in a world of pain. Uh, to go to mental health hospital, I also had to do something which many guys are scared of. I literally had to ask my employer for three weeks off for mental health leave. I made the conscious decision to call it what it is and not try and say it's for a vacation and a lie. And, and I was very vulnerable with that. And it got resounding applause and courage from my colleagues and bravery oh my god i would never have done something so brave and actually forced an entire different change in the workplace culture because people then all of a sudden were talking about it um it, it became you know this is important if someone like you can do it in a leadership position then i'm going to do it so there was a lot of benefits that came out of it that i fully didn't realize and i'm now a i'd say a more authentic version of myself as a post-diagnosis dad uh, I'm in a job that I think is even better than I was before because it's less stressful it's more authentic and it's um anyway I share this story only because I think it's quite similar and I, I just would hate to think that there's dads out there that are so stubborn proud you know naive naively ignorant about how you know how they're coping and they're you know we, we look ourselves in the mirror and we think that well we look pretty good sometimes we don't um and, you know, thank God my wife was, was as brave as she was to tell me. So otherwise it would be a very, very different story for me. So I, I you, you, now, yeah. You've been, uh, obviously that's that takes a lot of bravery to, to, to go through that. I think that, you know, certainly um, I think, uh, you know, the male brain through social conditioning has become wired in a way where we think we can, we're there to fix the problem and we're there to cope. We're supposed to be the st strong uh, the strong one. And when we're presented with a, you know, a world that changes from that day of diagnosis, when, we, when we're presented with that, we lose control. And um, to not have the ability to fix, um, to not really understand, to be scared about the pathway forward, not just for yourself, but for your children, for your family, um, is something that's really difficult to come to terms with. I, I don't think I've fully come to terms with that on my journey um, myself, um, uh, certainly inspired by um, by what you've uh, been through. And, and Vasily, I think you've indicated a, a, a similar sort of reckoning that um, that required you to have enough strength to um, to do something about the negative aspects associated with um, you know dealing. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. And um, uh, Rob, thank you for sharing this um, this uh, incredible story. And I think it just um, shows to um, to everyone that we we always need to be aware that um, uh, sometimes you know, like a, a, as another Rob said, um, the, the fixer can, can get broken, and uh, the fixer need the fix um, in a sense. And uh, um, I think uh, for me personally, um, you know, when we talk about the mental health. Um, 
I, I found very difficult to to face and challenge the my son's diagnosis at um, at early stages. Yes, I was looking after organizing all the paperwork and yes, trying to find all the supports. Um, you know, at the same time, mot- motivating the entire family and um, you know that everything will be fine. But deep down inside, I was um, completely broken and I felt like, oh look, I'm losing the ground. Um, I'm not sure. I'm I'm uncertain what's going to happen in the future. Suddenly, things that we were dreaming about, you know, going holiday, buying this, you know, doing that, it all started shaking, and then um, we like everything is falling apart. Um, like little sandcastle, basically, all our dreams. And um, we were at the point that I was started thinking, all right, what's going to happen in ten years' time? Um, how's my son going to be? Like now, he's nonverbal. He can't do this, that. And um, it was very, very difficult. I personally found the, you know, <laughs> I got, uh, I guess, you know, the escape in, in uh, you know, drinking. And um, that was my, that was my problem. Um, you know, after work, having extra beers and thinking everything will be fine. Um, waking up, you know, I never got to the point where I was like alcoholic and, you know, looking for, for a bottle. But, you know, it was the consistency of the drink. Pretty much like every single tray, I would have like a few glasses of wine to calm myself down and, you know, now looking back, uh, you know, from the, you know, 13 months of sobriety streak, I'm, I'm thinking all that drinking wasn't actually helping me. It was probably maybe just numbing a little bit of stress, but um, in a sense that it was actually creating more stress um, because it got to the point where I was like, all right, you know, like I probably need to drink because I had a really bad day, but day wasn't bad. You know, it was just another normal day. But in my mind, I was thinking that it's a bad day, just trying to find an excuse, you know, to um, you know, have a couple of beers after dinner. So um, I think, you know, and because drinking is such a such a socially accepted, um, so, socially accepted thing, um, nobody really pays attention to it. And uh, but it's it's really really dangerous, and you can burst and can kind of spiral down to the um, to the bottom of the bottle very very easily. So um, I guess you know that was that was something that I had personally to overcome. Um, you know, at one point I just realized, look, I'm, you know, completely out of weight. Um, I'm probably more depressed. I'm stressed. And, you know, being a father of autistic child, yes, our levels of stress are a lot higher than normal. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, like things were very, very difficult for me. So I had to, you know, reevaluate. I had to, um, you know, see where I'm standing and, you know, to make some life changing decisions. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, there is no, like perfect solution to to any father out there you know like oh you need to do this this and that um there's no protocol or follow these rules and you know your things will get better everyone needs to be just honest with themselves um understand you know hopefully you know if you're lucky you will have a the supporting family or you know the environment where you're supported um but most importantly you have to be honest and look at yourself in the mirror and say okay where i am right now what are my plans And, you know, as much as we'll hate, you know, these questions, where do I see myself in five years time? You know, we have to ask this question to ourselves and, you know, like what is going to happen? And, you know, it's important to to feel, to think positive. It's important to, um, you know, hope for something, but it's also very important to be honest to yourself and be very, very truthful. And if you do require support, whether it's, uh, you know, get some medical help or the help from the professionals, get the fitness health or anything, whatever that is, whatever is troubling you, go and ask for it. Don't assume that somebody's going to come to you and say, hey, look, you're overweight, you know, you need to do this and that. You need to be proactive. And that's probably the key thing. That's the only solution I see. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, you know, that the notion of going a bit e- easier on yourself too, that you are going to have bad days. There are going to be things that um, don't go to don't go to plan <laughs> most days, um, but 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 yeah, it's sort of having a, an understanding and uh, I guess a bit of uh, consideration for yourself that you're going to make mistakes, the, things aren't going to go right, but that doesn't mean you know uh, that it's all wrong. It's not, and those little wins I think are really important. Now, Charles, we're all you know challenged from a mental health perspective. Um, do you have any perspective on on that? Um. Yeah, it's interesting because I um, I also um, uh, was similar to Rob, but I didn't tell my work, um, and uh, and I was actually working in New York at the time, so I could just work nights whilst I was in like, a mental health institution for three weeks, um, and it just meant that I like you know, so I did get divorced, and I was misdiagnosed for ten years. So you know, I really wish that. I think if you're going to do it, I think it's really important. Like you are focusing on yourself, 
Um, and and that's the key thing that happens. Like, you know, you get that chance and it's amazing and it's beautiful that like your wife and your family, like firstly, had the strength to tell you because it's scary. And secondly, supported you so much. And mine did, but like, you know, I just didn't, I still let myself do things for other people, which meant that mm -hmm. I wasn't actually doing maybe what I should have done, which is to be nice to myself. Um, like sometimes I pretend that I'm talking to someone else rather than myself. And then I'm like, well, if I said that to someone else, that would be really mean and they'd get angry. So I'll be, so, you know, I try and rephrase it, which, which helps me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, like, it's amazing. Like, again, most, um, most things are circumstantial actually that can help me like in the environment and, um, and being aware of uncertainty really freaks me out. And, and, you know, and, and how much happiness, like having a, a schedule, like, you know, it's so weird because I'm an artist, but like I've got a to-do list. And when I get to the end of the to-do list and like it's in the morning, it's like wake up, eat some food, have some water, walk dog, put some more food on the plate. That's all I have. To oh, and do 15 minutes cleaning up. Like when I tick that box, I'm so happy. And I'm like, I like this stuff. It's cool. And it actually benefits my my house because I'm aware of the things, my, the things that kind of lead to me spiraling. Um, and even to Vasily's fault, I mean, um, to your point about alcohol, that was another thing really that benefited me. I was the same, but I was, I was like drinking a bottle every day. And, um, and it was really because there's nothing else to do at nighttime. Um, and so was, and I stopped that like at like uh, beginning of the year. And I'm like, everything is so much better. Like, you know, if I go to a bar, it's going to be uncomfortable anyway. So like, <laughs> like you know it doesn't matter if i drink or not um but the next but then the next day i feel like really good and happy and i can still get up at my time and i haven't missed like my, my push my, my press ups or whatever and so um good, good yeah i think charles the um the notion of uh social connection as part of health and world well-being I, I think that that that's that can be a challenge in our situations um, I just wanted to get yeah everyone's thoughts uh, thoughts on that. Uh, Vasily, do you have a how do you maintain your social connectiveness? Um, yes. <laughs> Look, I think uh, that's one of the one of the things. Um, once you like, let's say the diagnosis is a D day, and the, uh, like as Rob said, everything prior to your diagnosis is one one life. Anything after diagnosis is another life. I think. Um, look, for us personally, we've. Um, uh, we've like I'll be very honest. We lost a lot of friends um, since we were since our son got diagnosed. Simply because we ourselves were not really sure what to do. Uh, we were you know running to trying to organize different supports. It's time consuming. Um, it was it was a difficult time, and um, I think we didn't have enough time to maintain those social relationships with uh, with friends and uh, within our community. Um, and um, we've uh, we we've lost a lot. And um, at one point, I actually remember me and my wife we were. Um, doing the New Year's resolutions, and they were writing find new friends um, simply for the fact because <laughs> you know people dream of the new house. We were dreaming, find, we were we were dreaming about finding new friends, and the reason for that is because we felt so isolated. Because once you like once you got a, a child with a disability in your in in your family, um, you feel that this is kind of like your your own family problem type of thing. And uh, it's hard to reach out uh, to others. It's hard to be honest within the community. I myself come from a from a community background where the disability is a taboo um, and something that you know you don't really talk about this. And if you have a child with disability, just lock him somewhere in your house and never show him. So it was difficult to get the uh, acceptance, to get the understanding from uh, from within our uh, within our community um, and with our friends. Um, you know, we've uh, we've lost a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of connections with them. But saying that, what we've learned is we actually we did find a lot of new friends because you know the the world of autism opened out pretty much a new a new door for us, and now we interact with a lot of other families who got also autistic kids, and um, you know and we find out that we have a lot in common, um, and uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, that's how we maintain our relationships. Yes, we just changed one friend to another, um, but it's all fine. <laughs> the key thing here is. To to you know, like you have to allocate some time and work on those relationships, um, and you have to be social. It does help a lot. We are social creatures, and um, you know having some social interaction does help. 
but I understand, you know, I personally myself also sometimes, you know, being socially awkward and struggle with few things. And, um, you know, I might like talk too much and simply because I'm probably worried and stressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but so uh, it's, it's yeah. you relate to that. Uh, I, and another thing that I found is because our, our, our little boy uh, has uh, some behavioral issues. So uh, biting and hitting other kids is something that doesn't generally make you, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, you're not the number one in, invitee on the on the birthday party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that those things are a limitation as well. And and like you, um, we've lost some of those, uh, some of those friends, and and that's that's fine. But I think one of the real um, fantastic things for me getting this gig as CEO. Autism Awareness Australia, I'm meeting and finding new people that I don't have to explain, you know, that they know, they they get it. And and, and you've got something that you can re relate to in a very genuine, as we said before, authentic way. Um, yeah, so... And, and that relationship that, like, Rob, I just want to, like, point something out. Like, um, it's it's not just, like, for example, me and Rob, you know, we're both fathers of the, of the, of the kids of the similar age with autism, you know, like, obviously, yeah, we're related kind of by default. I actually, uh, like, uh, find myself relating a lot to Charles as well, what he's saying, mm -hmm. because, um, it's like, I, I do want to acknowledge what Charles is saying, being the autistic adult, that it's important to, um, you know, to, to self-advocate and impo important to voice those things and be open about it because how on earth I would learn what my son's future would be if I don't listen what the autistic adults right now are saying what their life is. And um, I think what Charles like mentioned throughout this conversation about how important for him the the schedules, the routine. Um, you know, I find that this is like yeah, like I can relate that as well to my son. You know, he's five, yet he wants to know every single morning where we're going and what we're doing for the for the remainder of the day, uh, mm -hmm. because those routines are really important for them. And yeah, we're kind of like I as a father, we learn that through kind of like you know pick and you know and learn type of thing but um charles you know like good on you you know for for being here and you know saying these things and sharing your experience and for yeah, somebody who's like being um uh, uh, being diagnosed you know like really late in life it's really important you know to find um you know to share the, those experiences and i guess you know like on that on that point i do have a question for you charles like like now that you've diagnosed, can you tell me more? Like how that changed your life? Like for you personally, in terms of like acceptance, understanding, or just general environment? Like what were the changes for you? Um, Jamal, I just wanted to say on one point, which which you brought up, um, where you were saying that like your son every day asks what's happening. Like that's the other like for me interesting like insight was every day is Groundhog Day. Like every day I I, I do that too. Like you know I'm like where am I? What's happening? And then I look at my list, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like, but it is every day. Like, you know, so, and people like, like, but like, you know, I guess it's, it's a lifelong disability. Like it's, it's, it's not going to come in one day. Um, but, you know, some things like, like for that, like, I actually think it's funny. Like, I'm like, yeah, it's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. Okay. I'll enjoy it. Um, but to answer your bigger question, um, Oh, it's like um, the world is not how you thought it was. Like it's like I'm like all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wow. Like the, you know, um, because the other thing also was, um, unfortunately, I'm, I was one of the children that got locked in the cupboard that you brought up, um, and so uh, my only survival mechanism was 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 really to learn how to copy the humans, or um, I don't know, and so. Um, I blocked nearly all my feelings and emotions because um, that's the only way I could survive. And so one of the difficulties actually is as I find these blocks um, and I start to remove them, um, they don't come back. And so um, I feel things more, you know, because I, I didn't know that um, or I might only get it for a little while but it, it becomes more intense because I didn't realize that my subconscious was suppressing something, um, which generally, you know, would be an anxiety about something such as um, a crowded room or lights or like lots of sudden noises. I would always like assign it to something else because I wouldn't know. And so that now I know what it is. Um, it's amazing because I can make my situation better 
But when I have to be in one of those situations and I, you know, there's just nothing you can do about it, um, then it's actually pretty intense. Um, so that's interesting. But yeah, like, you know, like everything for me has changed because of learning how perception works for, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I don't want to be derogatory, but just in my head, I call them, I call everything else the humans because I'm, because I've, you know, I just watch and copy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, um, yeah. Again, you've identified, you know, somebody else, a remarkable story of overcoming what were extreme challenges and what continue to be on a day to day very challenging and, and adapting. Uh, to that is just a, a sensational story. One of the things I, I'd, I'd probably like to um, uh, discuss is there's going to be a lot of dads out there that are plugged in um, because they might be in that carer situation uh, and probably through discussions, uh, again, listening to uh, Charles's perspective, are going to start to understand that they may be on the spectrum themselves and we, we hear many stories of that through the child's diagnosis, the parent uh, comes to understand um, why they thought that way. I mean, obviously, autism is relatively new in the scheme, mm -hmm. understanding. So uh, does anybody have any thoughts around that? I, I look I'll just I'll jump straight here I think it's really important like we know that autism is a is a genetic thing like there's no uh, medical marker for it so um it's quite common and the, as Europe said that um a lot of parents are finding there some traits of the autism in themselves through learning about the diagnosis of their of their kid um I guess you know for me personally I've reevaluated myself and um um you know and uh i don't think i'm I, I don't, i'm on the autism spectrum disorder but um there are some traits in me as well like you know i, I, I don't really enjoy you know social social uh, communication a lot i don't like big crowds um but um i think um what's important is for other parents out there to recognize that and uh, i think the key thing here is to be aware about what autism is um i think um with the with a lot of information that is out there on the on the internet um parents need to be very very careful in terms of where they're getting the the information from about the autism and um ensure that it's uh, from the credible um resources um and um because that will affect um like decisions on how what the what, uh, what therapy or what kind of evidence based therapy they're going to choose for their kids but also in recognizing like if they are on the autism spectrum disorder themselves um, they need to understand what autism it is like in, in the first place. Um, so, so yeah, like, and again, you know, like going back to Charles, you know, that's part of the reason why we need to hear the, the autistic voice to understand, um, you know, what autism is and from the first hand, from the experience, from people who experience it. Absolutely. Rob, do you have some thoughts here? Not so much on, on that as it relates to, um, myself but the you know i suppose a permeation of that is more um the other kids um as you said because it is genetic it's now something that you know we we looked left and right and saw that um my wife's cousin um has has a son who's autistic as well and then my elder son who's 17 is now trying to come to terms we'll say so what does that mean what does that mean for me what does that mean for my family um so i, I think it's got a few different branches not just for the um the dads themselves but to the left and right if you've got any other siblings as well that also um it, it's a thought so it very quickly becomes a a family um based okay, kind of topic yeah yeah, yeah so I, I guess um this is an all of community uh, approach i think if uh, men's health is addressed it needs to be addressed by not just men but by an understanding um, from everyone, regardless of, uh, of gender or identity, um, what's one thing you know, uh, you know, a partner or a family member could do uh, to support uh, men's health or uh, a man in their lives who, who may be may be struggling um, from day to day? Uh, Look, I, th I think um, I think for, like first thing that comes into my mind is uh, is communication, being being open with your partner, um, sharing. Um, communicating. I think these days we're quite often just locked in in ourselves, um, dealing with our own uh, personal problems. Um, but we need to be more open with our partners and um, you know to our wives and uh, talk to them. And if you're experiencing anything that is um, that is troubling you, 
share it. Don't be afraid of it. And um, I think in most of the cases, look, those women, they said yes to us, you know, like whatever the years ago at the at the altar, they said, yes, I will stay with you for the rest of the life. So to be honest, I don't think whatever we tell them, she's not going to learn anything new. <laughs> most likely she already know everything about us. But it's important for us to to start that communication because um, once we open, once we share, um, establish that communication, um, then we can you know face those problems and find the find the solution to them. Uh, Rob, uh, yep. Yeah, I was just going to say like I, it's it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so you know, one of the things I try to do to help um, dads, but it's now I've learned it's now helping you know mums and wives is I, I've started a podcast for dads of children with disability and to talk about stuff like we're doing today. And 50% of my listeners are women who listen and reach out to me to say they're trying to find ways to help their husbands actually get educated um, because, you know, what I've learned is that the women typically are more in tune to get educated, um, something that, you know, everyone's talked about, which is great, is learning from actual autistics like like Charles. And I'm a big fan of that as well. But I learned that because my wife was into it and she said, this is what we should be doing. And so typically women are more they're more looking for the education and the information so sometimes um yeah i mean things that maybe yes communication yes tell your partner tell tell your husband or if you see some things that are not they're not great it's a tough conversation i'd say just like my wife kudos to her but be persistent um because it, it, it is important to have those conversations but find other ways articles links to videos links to pop like things that um, you know, have a look at this. You never know what and what it might be that actually might get some moment of clarity. Um, it's not necessarily forcing, hey, you guys also have a, a, a son with autism. You should meet up and talk. Um, it's more just, you know, the organic stuff that they come across. But I, I think, um, I don't know, in my experience, um, there's a lot of information gathering. Um, so, so it can be very useful to just send it on. And I've learned a lot from her. So, um, yeah, I don't necessarily go looking for it, but I've now I've, I've found it. Yeah. Right. Charles, did you have any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, one was, and not relevant to the question, but I do really like the idea of autistic adults and autistic carers talking more because I learn from you too, because, you know, like I don't know what I don't know. And so when I talk to someone with more experience and they go, oh, yeah, and then there's, a, you know, when I got told about the fact that, the reason people have conversations and share their problems is because it makes them feel better. Like I was like, no way. Really? Yeah. I think I've already done that, but you know, um, anything that you know that helps your sons is something like, you know, everyone's autism is different and like, you know, there's all the different parts, but there's always something that like just one little tip can be so life changing for, cause that's how I see like living with autism is like, you're just consistently trying to find hacks around problems. So you're like, I can't do that, but what, how can I get what I, you know, but how can I get the outcome? Um, and you work through it. But I think my, my point was, was more, to, uh, what I wanted to make as my closing one was just more about um, uh, mental health and the best tip. And for me, it would be if someone is autistic or if someone is an autistic carer and they're telling you about it, please don't talk because what happens is you don't, or instead of, I know that people are probably doing it to try and be nice and they're trying to make you feel better by going, oh, it's not that bad or I might be a bit like this or, you know, like a, a person's natural response is to go, and, and I think, I don't know if you guys get it too, you know, like people try and make it more optimistic than it is just because, and they're kind people and it must be some human reaction or something. Whereas it's like, just don't say anything because unless you're like, uh, you have an experience that's like really relevant, um, it really makes me feel unimportant um, because it's really hard for me to explain what I'm about to explain anyway. And in a situation where your feelings and stuff have been denied, when you try and explain to someone that you've got something different and they go, well, it's not that bad or you can't be, like you probably don't go outside for two days. Well, I wouldn't, you know, because then you're like, oh, or well, then you start self-doubting and you stop doing all the positive things. And I'm sure for you guys, like, you know, um, you are probably, you know, 
you're just there's a reason why you're just disclosing as well like you're disclosing because of um either you need help from someone or you need someone to understand like your situation or um and so yeah just like let us have our space so we can either explain or um just sit with it like you know that would be my only thing no, that's fantastic and really, really important uh, lesson there. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, what's been a fantastic uh, discussion. I know I've got a lot out of it. I know people who will be logging in, uh, who have logged in uh, to this um, will be getting a lot out of it. And, uh, and those people can keep their comments coming. We'll have bios of each of the speakers today. Again, gentlemen, thank you very much. Wishing you all the best. Go men. <laughs> Yay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers.